you, you can't really approach a subject like this or actually read a verse like this without the thought coming to mind. The question everybody wants to know is, who's in charge here? That's what I want to know. Who's in charge? I have noticed in the last several years that the level of incompetency in businesses has increased dramatically. As I was speaking one time to, I was talking to my sister one time about some frustrations I was having, and her words to me was, yes, you have to do everybody's job for them. I have gotten to the habit of making sure that I confirm or receive acknowledgments on everything I do multiple times because just because you email something don't mean they received it. And just because you email something doesn't mean they understood it. I was taught uh, and, and have learned from others that when you give people instructions, have them repeat it back to you so you will know that they understood what you communicated clearly. And I have found that even that fails. They can recite it right back to me and still do something that's totally opposite of what I was trying to communicate. It's frustrating to say the least. And so this is the kind of world we live in. And when you get to that point, you normally just want to say, can I speak to a supervisor, please? I, I just, you know, I'm tired of the, and I don't mean this to minimize anything, but the paper pushers, the entry clerks, Sometimes they just don't have the authority or the experience or the competence to just take care of the request. And so I apologize for expressing and venting some of that to you today. But by the looks on your faces, I see that I have an agreement. So the question is, who's in charge here? And then the other question is, is when you know who's in charge, do you acknowledge who's in charge? Two men come to mind very quickly. One in the book of Acts, his name was Herod. And he was the typical politician, people pleaser. And he wanted to do everything that pleased them. And so he did that. He did some decisions that pleased the people. And when he gave a speech one day, they all cried out to pamper him and to appease him. Oh, it is the voice of a God and not of man. And Acts chapter 12 says, immediately... Because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms and died because he didn't acknowledge who was in charge. It's not humorous, but it is interesting to look at the account where Jesus, the creator of the universe, God in flesh, the Messiah, the Son of God, standing before a Roman ruler, Pilate. And Pilate wants him to explain himself to him. <laughs> you know, Pilate didn't know he was the king of glory. And Jesus didn't go around, as we would say, tooting his own horn. And so Jesus is merely answering the question and many times keeping silence, not even addressing the accusation. And Pilate became very frustrated at this convict or this accused convict before him. He had never seen a prisoner or someone arrested act like this in front of him. Most of them are pleading their case and, and ranting and raving and talking about how their accusers got it all wrong. And here Jesus stands very quietly and Pilate says, do you refuse to speak to me? The NIV says in John chapter 9, don't you realize I have the power to either free you or crucify you? He had no clue who he was talking to. Jesus would have known before he knew. Don't you know I have the power to do that? And Jesus answered, you'd have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Somebody knew who was in charge. And the text that I read today from Daniel chapter 4 is exactly that kind of a story. It's the, it's the story of Daniel that, uh, that is written where King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man on the face of the earth, maybe even to this day, he was not, we say that the president is the most powerful leader of the free world or of the greatest country in the world, but Nebuchadnezzar was more than that. He didn't have a Congress to answer to. He didn't have to win elections. He didn't have to campaign. He didn't have to 
go along with people who were financing him. He was totally unlimited in what he could do. He was the supreme leader, ruler on earth. And he was the king who had come in and taken Israel, or more technically Judah captive, and had destroyed Jerusalem and had taken out of them their most precious resources, young men who were capable of learning and helping. Of those four men, we know them We know them by Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's amazing how we use Daniel's Hebrew name, but we use the other three's Babylonian name. Daniel had a Chaldean name as well, was Belteshazzar, because it was a name that honored their false god, Bel. And these four boys have been taken into captivity and God sustained them, used them, and equipped them with wisdom because they were faithful to their God, even in a strange place. But Nebuchadnezzar had a dream in the fourth chapter. And um, he had called all his men before him and said, I want you to in- interpret this dream. And they were unable to do it. For those of you that are familiar with the story, realize I'm just going to hit a few highlights here as we go along. But he had a dream, and in this dream, he saw a great tree in the middle of a great land. It was a strong tree, very large. The Bible says he described it as it touched to the sky. It had beautiful leaves, abundant fruit. The word is used that it had food for all. Birds lodged in its branches and the wild animals found refuge underneath in its shade. It was a great, tremendous tree. And while that tree was standing, there came an angel and a voice from heaven that said, Cut down the tree. Cut it down. Cut it down, but leave the stump and the roots. And then I want you to bind it with iron and bronze. Because it will live again. And Nebuchadnezzar could not make any sense of this dream. And when one thing came to another, Daniel was called and Daniel said, I'll interpret that dream for you. It's some commentators feel like maybe the other guys were able to at least shed some light on the dream. But they were scared because they knew the dream was applicable to Nebuchadnezzar. And they didn't want to be the guy to tell him, you're the man. But Daniel, by the wisdom and the boldness of God, said, Oh, oh king, this tree represents you. You have the greatest kingdom. You're a great thing. You're great. And this kingdom belongs to you. But you're going to be cut down. You're going to be brought down. You're going to be brought down so that you will understand. May I put it this way? Who's in charge here? God took the time for a heathen, pagan, idolatrous sovereign. A man of unlimited power and ability who had built, in a sense, a great kingdom. But what he didn't know is that everything he built, he could not have built if God had not allowed it. And so God took the time. He could have just took him and wadded him up and threw him aside. He could have slain him instantly like he did Herod who did not acknowledge God. But instead God took the time, the energy, and the knowledge to say, I'm going to make sure this man understands who's in charge here and who really is the king of kings. And so Daniel said to him, here's the interpretation. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth and He gives them to anyone that He wishes. This is the whole purpose of the dream and the whole purpose for your experience is so that you can acknowledge who God is. Not to increase your wisdom, not to increase your wealth, not to do anything else for your betterment, but it is important that you understand who God is and that He controls everything. 
I have no idea what his reaction was. He must have thought, oh, that's interesting. We'll see. I mean, Scripture doesn't tell us. But it does tell us that a year later or 12 months from the time of that dream. Some scholars say that he had, been, he had just completed a great palace in a matter of a short time. And he was so enthralled with it. But he was walking one morning and he looked about and he just got impressed with himself. You ever done that? You're just impressed with yourself. Just don't shake your head no at me. There's a couple of times you go, well, I can't believe I did that. And it was a good thing you're talking about, not a bad thing. Wow, look at that. Be careful. Be careful. I'm not saying you're in Nebuchadnezzar's world, but here he is. He walks in and he goes, look at this great Babylon, which my hand hath built. Guess he forgot the dream. And it seemed like almost instantly he lost his sanity. You know, sanity is nothing but a bubble on the water anyhow. Think about it. I know we all sit here and say we're in our sound mind and we're doing good. But, you know, it don't take, it don't take but a lack of sleep or some other little thing to make your thoughts go a little crazy. Just let your oxygen level drop a little bit and see what kind of thoughts you start having. It's a, it's a bubble on the water. Thank God every day we get up with a sound mind. Some of us, thank God we just get up with a mind. <laughs> we'll take what we can get. <laughs> but he lost his sanity in a moment. And when he did, they drove him out of the palace. You know, some scholars and critics have said, well, there's no record of it ever happening that. But you know what is peculiar is that in the, in the writings of the Babylonians during those seven years, there was exactly seven years where nothing was written, written about what Nebuchadnezzar accomplished or said or did. And they drove him out and he lived out in the field. Every morning he woke up with the dew on him. His fingernails grew long. His hair grew long. He was a savage. He was a beast. And... What's amazing about it is, is it's, uh, it is presumed that Daniel was in charge of the kingdom during all that time because the kingdom kept on going. But they hid it. We know as well that a lot of times there's a lot of things the media hides from us that politicians do or are. And so you would think in that world it would not have been that difficult. But he, he, he ate, was out there and lived like an animal for seven years. It was a form of insanity. It was brought unto him by God. It was according to the dream and the fulfillment of the Scripture. And it was that that God allowed to happen. And, the, and so after seven times or seven years, finally, his sanity came back to him. Watch Daniel chapter 4 and verse 34. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generations to generations. Listen to what he says. All the people of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases. Stop. Selah. He does what he pleases. With the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? I paraphrase. Who do you think you are? Why did you do that? Give an account for that. No one can say that to God. He does what he wants to do. And now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven. Because everything he does is right and all his ways is just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. So God has contained in his word today an example of a highest man of authority who's brought to humility for the purpose of understanding that God is in charge. And so we come today with the same idea. To find out who is in charge. The greatest lesson we can learn as followers of Christ is who is in charge. Now I hope this will be plainer as we go through this. We must learn first of all that he is in charge. 
Unfortunately, today's type of American Christianity is all about coming to Jesus like he's some kind of cosmic Santa Claus. It's all about what he does for us. But the first thing we must learn is that he's in charge. He does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, with who he wants, and he doesn't ask any questions from me. That is. So here's the first thing we must understand if we're going to walk before this great king, if we're going to learn him and understand him, is that he is God and we are not. I just dropped a bomb, but I guess everybody's on the same page. He's God and we are not because we're all guilty of saying, why God or how come God or telling God how to do it and when to do it. But he's God and we are not. And the Holy Ghost gives us the, the access to him to come boldly to him by faith. But you'll never order God around because he is God. I don't know why he heals some people immediately, some he takes over time, and some he takes home. I don't understand that. But he is God, and I am not. It seems like those who don't need riches get riches, and those who need riches end up poor. I don't know why princes are walking and servants are riding, Solomon said. But this is one thing is true. He is God, and I am not. Job put it this way. He stands alone. And who can oppose him? He does whatever. He pleases. Here's a man who has lost his family. He's lost his wealth. He's lost his business. He's lost everything, even his health. And he says, he stands alone. You know, that's the last thing I want to say when I'm going through a hardship. That he can do whatever he wants. I'm not important in the equation. Some would say, oh yeah, you're of great value to God. I know I am in that perspective. But when it comes to God, He knows what's best for me. He is the greater good of any good that's in the world. He knows the end from the beginning. And Job said, He does whatever He pleases. Even David says, our God is in heaven. And He does whatever pleases Him. So He is God and I am not. Isaiah 9 and 6, most of us could probably quote it, but let's read it again this morning. For unto us a child is born and a son is given. But the next part says, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. He's in charge. All authority. And you may say, well, it doesn't look like that. Well, it, it, it hasn't, you know, there's been all times through the history of the world that it didn't look like there was a God even existed but that doesn't mean that he isn't God. Everybody could become an atheist tomorrow and he'd still be God. <laughs> we can't vote him out or vote him in. He's God. He's been here before we were and will be after we're long gone. And the government will be upon his shoulders. It is an amazing how we can put God everywhere except on his throne. Because when we put him on his throne, that gives him the sovereign choice to do whatever he wants to do. I ran across a story this week that I found somewhat humorous, and I think I hope you'll find it edifying. It's a story of a man by the name of George McClausen. Many, many years ago, he was the director of a YMCA in western Pennsylvania. And uh, it was a difficult situation. The YMCA was losing money, membership, staff. He wasn't sure what to do. He was working 85 hours a week trying to fix things. Couldn't sleep at night. Even when he wasn't on the job, he was worrying about it. Some of us that are self-employed get that. Some of you that are not get it too, just in different ways. A therapist told him, said, if you don't change things, you're going to have a nervous breakdown. You need to let go and let God. <laughs> Isn't that, when you're going through a real hard time, someone says, and they mean, they mean it with all their heart. And they're saying the truth. You need to let go and let God. But all of us are trying to work through how to do that. How do I just let go and let God? And so they were encouraging, you need to let go. Let God have charge. So one day he decided he was just going to get away. So he took his notebook and he wandered out into the forest. And the farther he got in the woods, the more relaxed he felt. He started feeling a little bit of relief. Nothing really changed. He sat down under a tree. And as the story goes, for the first time in his life, he took a deep breath. He took out his notebook and he decided to let go of the burdens of his life. And I find this humorous. He wrote a letter that simply said, Dear God, 
Today I resign as the general manager of the universe. Love, George. Dear God, today I resign as the general manager of the universe. Well, I'm glad I read about George this week. I wish I'd have read about him sooner. I think I need to write that letter. I think some of you may need to write that letter. Dear God, I resign as the general manager of the universe. But here's what's even more funny. He said the Lord spoke back to him and he said, God accepted my resignation. I'm so glad he accepted my resignation. The problem is, is we're not to the point yet where we've resigned. You got to let go and let God. Here's a news flash. Jesus is fully capable of bearing the full weight of the world and all his problems. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But we're like Nebuchadnezzar. Look at everything I've done. Look at all the things I have to maintain. Look at all the cares I have. And we have plenty of them. But never forget, God is in charge. Unless I be misunderstood, that doesn't mean you sit back and do nothing. That just means he makes all the decisions. But you may well, probably undoubtedly always do a lot of the work. But he makes the decisions a famous Frenchman once said the graveyards are filled with indispensable men Charles de Gaulle famous man World War II he said the graveyard is filled with indispensable men what he was saying is is everybody that lived in their time thought they were probably the most important and significant thing going and how would the world get by without them I have a high standard that I hold in our business affairs and we have a certain level of quality that we try to produce and sometimes I'll go into places and I'll see where others have done quality that's not so good or didn't take as much pride in their workmanship and then I have to remind myself, but Ed, you can't do it all. <laughs> I mean, there's three million people in this metropolis area and the amount of work I do is hardly a drop in the bucket. Things are going on. Remember the time my wife was having difficulty when she was, when she was carrying Landon? And, um, you know, everything had to be just right in the house. Everything had to be clean. The ritual, the schedule, everything had to be all done. The doctor said, you can't do that. You need to, you, you, this child's going to come premature. You need to sit down. You need to really, she's like, well, I have to do this and I have to do that. And he looked at her and he said, what we repeat in our family a lot of times, in a, will it matter in a hundred years? Will anybody even remember that you kept the house spotless in a hundred years if you can't give it a break for two weeks? Now, please don't leave and say that I'm promoting laziness. <laughs> But there are some things that we take upon ourselves. We need to be reminded that He is God. But we can't acknowledge that or see that until we become humble in spirit. You know, there was one place where Jesus said to His disciples, He actually was praying and gave thanks to God. He said, I thank You, O Lord, that You've hid these things from the wise and the prudent, but revealed it even unto babes. He wasn't talking about small babies, physical babies receiving revelation. He was talking about those who were young and tender in heart, those who were open to understanding and teaching, that those who weren't so high and mighty, the elitist, the proud, the arrogant, but it was those who was humble in spirit would be able to see and receive the things that God wanted them to have. As I have quoted before many times, that it is, it, it is the attitude of the heart that is more important than a lot of times what is being said. You cannot receive what is being said unless the heart is right. It is a matter of being brought down and being humbled. So I was made aware that the church of nativity in Bethlehem has a very interesting way about it. This church where they say Jesus was you know, where the manger was and it was born and it's been built and rebuilt and all these things have happened. In the 1500s, there was, there was people who were actually driving their carts into the church of nativity. They say kings would ride their horses, just ride it straight through there to either plunder it or to do whatever they were going to do. And the people became very upset 
that people would just drive their carts right into the church and take out of it whatever they wanted. So they decided, we'll take care of that. So they took the entryway and they lowered the height. And they tell me it's still that way today, that if you go into the church of nativity in Bethlehem, you have to duck and bow down to get inside it. <laughs> and as one commentator said, you got to get off your high horse. When you want to know that God is great and when you want to know that He is supreme and when you see Him as He is, you can't do it from a level that's high. You've got to do it from a level that's low. You've got to be humbled in humility before Him. And God thought so much of Nebuchadnezzar that He actually would allow this to happen in His life so He could come to that point and to that understanding and to that knowledge. But Paul puts it this way. When he quotes from the Old Testament, As it is written, surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. That's a word that I need to hear today, not because I want to rub it in someone's face. Not because I want to look at those who are politically active and to those who are causing civil unrest or even to look at anybody that I may consider not appropriate for me and say, yeah, every knee is going to bow. I serve God, but your knee is going to bow. That's not the attitude of the Scripture. It's a blanket statement that really just says, He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Not everybody knows it. Not everybody sees it. But everybody one day will acknowledge the fact that He is God and I'm not. Science is not God. Politics is not God. Money is not God. He is God. And I am not. And the sooner we write that resignation letter, the more blessed we will be. And so Paul summarizes, and I summarize as well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when he gives explicit directions about the gifts of the Spirit and how they are used and for what purpose they ought to have. He said, I want you to know that no man speaking by the Spirit of God says... Jesus be cursed. No gift of the Spirit will ever denigrate Christ. Will never take Him out of His position. Even if someone prophesies or speaks in tongues and interprets, and it be a good thing, if it takes away from the glory and the honor and the centrality of Christ, it is of no good and it is of no use. Every gift will glorify and honor God. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Ghost within us that allows us to acknowledge the Lordship of Christ. To acknowledge that He is King and He is ruler of all. And to let Him have His way in our lives. Someone said the other day about, uh, made a, uh, an offhand statement to me about, well, if you do this and that and all the other, you'll go against your religion. <laughs> And I, I, I listened to that remark and I wasn't sharp enough, quick enough to respond. But, you know, it's not about the fact that it's a religion and a lot of rules and do's and don'ts. But it's because I can acknowledge He is Lord. I let Him speak into my life. I, I let the Word of God direct my path. If the law says that something is wrong, I obey the law as long as I don't have to go against God. But if the law says something is, is, is right when it isn't right, I live by the law of God. Why? Because the Spirit of God says, I want to be under the Lordship. I want to be under the care of God. It's not what men allows me to do. It's what God asks me to do to walk before Him and please Him. And the greatest understanding we will ever gain is that He is God and I am not. He is God. And I am.